What's up, everybody? Welcome to System Crafters. I'm David Wilson, and today we've got a special edition of the System Crafters live stream. We're going to be trying to integrate the uh, command shell called New Shell with Emacs. Uh, so we'll let people filter in for a little bit here and see who sh who's able to show up today. This is a very uh, unusual time for me to stream, but that's because we're trying to uh, meet up with, uh, with JT here, who's in New Zealand. So it's like 8 a.m. there right now, right? It is 8 a.m. bright yeah. and early. Yeah, it's, it's a little bit too early, but that's I guess how these things go sometimes. Um, so let's see. Let's say hello to Alejandro, uh, Hyder, GK Sudo, Simon, uh, Purple G, Rune, uh, Nova, Technomog, uh, Spiggy, Spiggy. I guess you could call it that. <laughs> I'm I'm not really good with pronouncing names. Nice stream quality. Yeah, we'll see how that works over time because I'm like, you know, sharing my screen and streaming at the same time and probably will end up with uh, some CPU issues. Cool. So, uh, like I said, today is a sort of a, a special stream because it's the first time I've actually done a collaboration stream with anybody before. And uh, uh, it's exciting to me because I get to talk to somebody who I actually know and uh, like to chat with. Uh, this is uh, JT, who runs the Systems with JT YouTube channel. Uh, they also stream on Twitch, and you can find them on Twitter at uh, the Twitter account here, J-N-T-R-N-E-R. -E it's T -T okay. I'll let you read that because I'm not, I'm not you saying it correctly. It. I think I'll uh, put another <laughs> E in there. So anyway, uh, uh, JT is a former coworker of mine and also a friend, and uh, uh, you may also know them from the TypeScript team. Uh, they worked there in the past at, on the compiler team for TypeScript and also the Rust team at Mozilla. So a uh, well-known person and, and you know a person who knows a lot about programming languages. So if you enjoy uh, learning about you know systems programming, programming or programming languages, uh, check out their channel, uh, Systems with JT. There's a link in the uh, show notes, which I will put here at the very end of the stream. Um, yeah, uh, thanks so much for, for joining me today, JT. I really appreciate uh, you, you know, being a guinea pig for my first stream collaboration. <laughs> thanks for having me. This will be fun. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so what we're going to try to do today is uh, use Emacs to be sort of like an interface for uh, the new shell command shell. And uh, uh, JT is here because uh, they're one of the maintainers and I would say co-creators of, of new shell, right? Yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah, JT is uh, is very knowledgeable about uh, Rust programming because obviously they were a member of the Rust uh, language team, but uh, they're also you know one of the creators of this shell. So I think uh, this is going to be really interesting to see how we can put our minds together and try to make something in the span of about two hours. Let's see who else is showing up today. Uh, we have uh, Ronnie, um, Alex, uh, Vitor, Adolfo. Um, I think that's everyone and David. All right, so let's see. So if you have not heard about New Shell before, it's basically a uh, a newer command line shell. I'm going to move you down here a little bit, uh, JT. Sounds good. And um, it deals with uh, information in a structured way. So typically, whenever you're dealing with a POSIX compliant shell like Bash or Z shell or anything else that, that falls into that category, um, whenever you try to send information between command line programs, you're doing that with text streams. Uh, however, new shell is different in that it actually will send structured text objects, or sorry, structured objects for the data that goes between the commands, or at least the ones that are at the level of uh, new shell's own command system. So um, because that's the case, it actually makes it easier for you to do operations on that data. So you don't have to send it through another program, like let's say set or awk to process the information and then transform it. You can just do it directly inside of new shell itself. And uh, for our cases in trying to hook it up into Emacs, uh, we can take that structured data and pass it into Emacs to then be processed and then send it out the other side potentially to then go along with the rest of the command shell. So we're going to try to see what we can do with that today. We may not make a whole lot of progress, but it might be fun to try to do it. So uh, we'll see how that goes. 
Um, so if you want to check out more about New Shell, definitely check out the website, uh, newshell.sh. And you can also follow the Twitter account at uh, new underscore shell. Uh, if you go try to look at uh, New Shell without the underscore, you're going to find some random person who decided that was a good name. <laughs> so, uh, uh, but that's cool, though. Person. You know, yeah. Yep. I'm, I'm sure they probably get a lot of weird questions about Rust. Um, <laughs> All right, so Hyder says, massive respect for Rust programmers. Yeah, Rust programmers, you know, they're trying to do like the next generation systems programming. So uh, I think that's really cool. Let's see. Good vibes. Yeah, I like that. Uh, good to see you as well, uh, Pimic YouTube. Uh, Nova says, could you use this with MATLAB? I, I don't know. Uh, JT, have you any thoughts that's on that? That's a good question. I feel like um, one of the things that... Uh, so the, the basic foundation of new shell is that it's the structured shell where you're sending structured data between the commands. But we really have aspirations to grow it almost, I, I feel like maybe this is a, a little cheeky, but if you'll bear with me, almost like the Emacs of the shell. Um, the, the way that you can compose, the way that you can configure the system and all of that is really flexible and also allows us to move up and out of the terminal as well at some point. So being able to connect this into something like a Python Jupyter Notebooks or MATLAB could very well be possible in the future. Yeah, definitely. I think it makes a lot more sense to be a tool for data science or, or DevOps or anything like that because you have that access to the structured information and you don't have to like reach for so many other tools to, to do that. So a person could learn how to use New Shell a lot easier than using, let's say, Bash for the same thing. I would think so. Yeah, yeah for sure. That's awesome. Uh, so I realize now that I just sort of said a whole lot of stuff about New Shell and didn't let you uh, give any other type of <laughs> introduction. So if there's another way that you would like to describe it, uh, th please feel free. No, I think that's pretty good. I mean, the, the idea is that, like you're saying, there's a set of commands, internal commands, that share structured data with each other. And there's also a plugin system. If you want to write plugins to extend it to do additional set of functionality, you can do that. Um, so it's very powerful in the sense that it's extensible and um, these plugins and these commands kind of play together with this structured data. It's kind of a universal structured data format. Yep. So I, I think one of the, the challenges with POSIX is that, like David was saying, you're always passing text between commands, which means you have to reparse the text on the other side. You have to agree on this output format. And the original uh, motivation behind POSIX around being able to compose Unix commands together, it, it works okay, but there's so much better ways that it can work, especially in a more modern, structured way. Um, one way to think of it is that you might have M commands that produce data and then N commands that can filter it, and then you can mix and match these. You don't have to think, okay, how in the world do I get the, the output of LS into something that can parse LS and get the right files set out and then from there pass it on to something else? Everything just clicks together like Legos. So I, I think that that's kind of the right mental model. And then there's a whole bunch of fun stuff that we built up and around this structured data. Yeah, it's, uh, it's really exciting to me because it's... Um... It kind of takes some of the ideas that you've seen from other shells, like maybe PowerShell, but taking it to the next level because now you've got this uh, really solid language for uh, being able to write systems level programming and not really, you know, use some, you know, scripting language to do that. You have like a real, you know, a language under the covers. But then I guess there's some maybe some scripting capability with a new shell as yeah. well. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the yeah, the the high power, like really efficient data processing still happens underneath the surface, like you're saying. We use Rust to full advantage on the data and on the processing, so it's really efficient. Um, and we also built a programming language on top. I can't help it. That's my background, you know, working on JavaScript and TypeScript and Rust and all these other languages. Um, so yeah, we, we made this other programming language kind of grown up around this ability to compose commands together. So if you wrote something in Python and then ported that to New Shell, quite often it may actually look a little bit better. <laughs> I'll, I'll leave the to the to the listener to, to kind of make that judgment. But I, I think that. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, I, I would imagine it's going to be like at least an order of magnitude faster. It is definitely faster. And it's also um, 
it it has this really natural property of being able to do incremental development. So I'm in the ID, I'm in the uh, the CLI, which is a REPL, and then I can say, all right, if I run this command and then pipe it into this one, what does the data look like at that point? And if I do one more step, what does the data look like? So I used it to great effect. Re even recently, I threw together a programming language jam where people were making a programming language over the weekend and how we tallied all the votes and, and checked all the projects in and everything was all handled from new shell scripts that I wrote on the fly as I noticed new things that we needed to do. That's so, awesome. Yeah, I didn't know that. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, that's really cool. So uh, if, if you all are interested in checking out uh, New Shell, you can actually go and look at the website, uh, newshell.sh, and there's a demo here. I think that um, they're actually able to um, compile this to WebAssembly so that you can try it in the browser if you want to. And there's also a lot of uh, documentation as well about how to right. use the various commands. Yeah, that's all That's all the real New Shell. Uh, yeah. compiled to WebAssembly and running in WebAssembly. Yeah, which is pretty impressive. You don't really see that with uh, you know, Bash or, or Z Shell. So this, if you want to try it out, if you don't want to have to install it on your machine yet, definitely give that a shot. Uh, i got a couple questions here in the chat. Uh, GK Studio says, I don't know what po uh, POSIX is being a fish user. Yeah, well, you probably wouldn't because fish, <laughs> fish is another nice. uh, variant out there that doesn't follow POSIX. Uh, Crazy Chicken says, so the intent was always to create a separate language for the shell, like fish, but, uh, but with object-oriented data structures. Yeah, it's more, it's much more in a functional style. If you wanted to compare it to something like PowerShell, PowerShell is very object oriented. You're calling methods, you're mutating variables, that kind of thing. Um, the style that we use in New Shell, and kind of to David's background, it feels a little bit more like the OCaml F sharp style, where you're composing things and mutation is is not something like it's not part of the model as much. Uh, so mostly you're just thinking about how do I take a piece of data and convert it from that shape to a different shape until I get it to the shape that I want it to be. Yeah, definitely. Uh, uh, Jaka says, in my opinion, in opinion, new shell plugin API with using JSON is not very efficient for a huge amount of data. Nice if it could support some binary format for big tables. Yeah, totally. Yeah, totally. I feel like um, there's a few places when we were designing new shell, we went very wide. So like we knew we wanted some kind of plugin thing, so we hacked together a plugin format in a weekend and then moved on to other things. Um, as we get closer to 1.0, we're going to want something that allows you to do high efficient bi-directional uh, communication with New Shell. Yeah, well, it seems like, uh, you know, being Rust, you're in a very good um, uh, situation because there's a ton of, you know, structured binary data packages out there that you can just take and use, and it, it might be pretty easy to do that. Uh, so yeah, I think that was that's probably going to be a pretty straightforward thing. Well, in my opinion, I don't really know for sure. <laughs> no, yeah, I think that's true. And a lot of serialization, deserialization, Rust has a, a ton of that support, really at easy access. Um, Yuka was talking about Arrow and Parkhead, and we actually do support those as well. And that would be fun to circle back around to plugins and say, hey, can we use the new Arrow technology we just added uh, in the last couple of versions and bring that into plugins? Definitely. Uh, let's see what else we have. Uh, Technomog says, uh, how's the forward compatibility story right now? Still lots of things in flux are pretty stable with promises of forward compatibility. I would say with a giant asterisk, it's pretty stable. Um, we will probably still make some renames and changes as we settle in. But the if you learn the philosophy behind New Shell, I doubt that's going to change very much. So you'll be able to carry a lot of what you learned forward. That's good. Yeah, definitely. Uh, let's see. Uh, Pimic. Yeah, Pemek YouTube says GitHub demos shows some usage and tricks. Looks really impressive. Yeah, is that, I think that's great to provide something like that on the, on the website so that you can try it out without having to install it or anything. You can just go get a, a good um, idea of what it can do. Matt Hudson says, can I use new shell with Postgres SQL or Postgres SQL? How, how do people pronounce that? Pro Postgres as a I, data backend? I say post Postgres SQL. Yeah. Postgres SQL. Like, I don't know. You're probably right. Um, so the, the language itself has has been kind of growing to be able to work with various data formats. So we just added Apache Arrow and plugged into the Apache Arrow ecosystem. Uh, Postgres is another good one that we could add a backend for. Um, there's a little bit that we'd want to do with being able to take the query, compile it into a SQL query for Postgres so you get the, the best efficiency. But uh, 
yeah, I, 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 it's something we're definitely talking about. Yeah, it's, there's so many options, so many possibilities that, I mean, pretty much the sky's the limit. Anybody can come in and write an extension to do this. Uh, so yeah, I mean, if you're interested in Rust and you're interested in command shells, then you should definitely check out, you know, how to write extensions or even contribute to the new shell project because there's like, like I said, the sky's the limit. You can do whatever you wanted to basically. And this is a very uh, smart team of people who are working on it. So, you know, I'm sure they'll be very happy to uh, to have your contributions or at least your, you know, your, your feedback at the GitHub repository. Yeah, we love new folks. So yeah. come on in. Uh, Purple G says, I call it P-O-S-T-G-R-E-S-Q-L. Okay, well, that that doesn't really roll off the tongue. And if you're in a meeting and people are going to be spending like half the meeting just saying the word, I think it's not going to work too well. Nice. Uh, Yuka says, where is MySQL and MariaDB? Well, it's same answer, I suppose. I mean, you could, you, you could easily put that in or, okay, easily. You know, typical programmer speak, we say easily, you know, but, you know, always the devil's in the details. Yeah. But it's possible. Yeah, if if folks do, if folks are actively interested in database connectivity, definitely come on because that is a, definitely an area where we're actively brainstorming and planning for the next few versions. And uh, as you'll see, when we play around with New Shell a little bit, you're going to see exactly how it makes sense to use this for uh, interacting with the database because it gives you really nice table layout uh, for, for information. It's almost like an interactive database browser in a sense. Like if you actually have this, you know, DB backend. Then right. if you just list things directly from a DB and look at it as a table and do manipulations to everything, I think it would be pretty awesome. Yep, I agree. All right, so uh, let's talk about what we might do to integrate New Shell with Emacs today. So there's, there's a few um, ideas that JT and I had when we were talking about this a few weeks back. And uh, only two story points, okay. Well, that your, your two story points are my 12, I don't know. Um, so, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> We're, we're talking like, uh, you know, was it planning poker now or, or, or scrum planning? Oh, is that what it is? Uh, so Pimic YouTube is now coining a new phrase that the Davy Wills in the details. Yeah, well, <laughs> if, if you get me involved in a project, I'm going to give you 15 million ideas that can never be achievable. Uh, oh, I love it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, the ideas were, first of all, you know, the, the most obvious basic thing we could do is try to run new shell commands and then interactively view the output in Emacs. So, you know, in Emacs, you have this nice friendly environment for being able to, you know, edit text, make bulk edits, and also to display things in a way that is very um, uh, amenable to uh, reading and searching and, and also whatever kind of custom functionality you've built for yourself with Emacs. So uh, we're going to try to see if we can get um, some new shell command output to show up in a tabulated li list view inside of Emacs. And we'll see exactly how um, that works. Or if I can even get it to work, we'll see what happens today. Um, also, one really cool thing would be is if we could make um, this functionality an extension to new shell such that you could pipe the output of a command through uh, this extension or this uh, command, I guess you could say, that shows the uh, output inside of Emacs, allows you to edit things, maybe sort and filter, and then confirm that and then pass that on through the pipeline so that the next command in the list can take that and do something with it. So um, it will give you sort of like an interactive editing capability for the output of new shell commands, which I think it would be pretty interesting. Um, to, to see that working. We'll, we'll see if it's possible, but uh, you know, if we don't get it done today, we might do another stream and see what else we can do with it. And then a couple of more obvious things for anybody who's familiar with uh, Emacs and org mode is we could hook it up to org Babel to make like a Jupyter style interactive notebook so that you could have, you know, uh, new shell source blocks and then execute those, get output in a structured format inside of the buffer and then potentially do further computation on those in uh, future blocks. And then lastly, uh, literate DevOps with org mode. If you've ever seen Howard Abrams' video about lit literate DevOps in Emacs, uh, this is like sort of one step further where you could have an even more powerful shell language and shell, you know, command shell to um, have blocks of commands that you're doing to do, you know, system administration or ops or anything like that and uh, you know, run new shell directly inside of Emacs to do that. So a lot of different cool things we could do. There's probably a lot more things. And if anybody has ideas for other ways that might be interesting to connect uh, Emacs and new shell, uh, definitely leave them in the chat. But I would say it's better if you give them to us through um, the comments on the video or on Twitter or something else so that we can kind of keep track of those because the chat in the stream is kind of ephemeral. So. Um, what we'll do right now, I think maybe the best place to start is to try messing around a little bit in New Shell. And for me, I haven't really used New Shell very much. I know that I can type some, you know, 
batch like commands or unix style commands into it but aside from that i don't know too much so maybe jt will give me a little bit of a primer on what i might want to do in the shell and then we can start trying to figure out how to wire that up to emacs yeah that sounds great so i mean the most obvious thing that i can do in the shell let's say let me jump to a better folder so projects code and we have you know full completions and whatnot as you expect to have from a shell uh let's say emacs from scratch i'm going to do ls dash al and one thing that you may have noticed while I was typing there is it actually gives me uh, like the fish style uh, command suggestions, I guess, based on history or is that based on um, yeah. even docs? Yeah, that's the the history hint. Yeah. Um, we don't have docs parsing yet, but that would be a fun one to add. So what uh, what key binding do I hit to actually make it complete this um this suggestion. It's the right arrow. Right arrow? Yeah. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, I didn't know that one. I think that I'm used to control F or something from fish. Maybe I'm wrong about that. But um, yeah, super cool to have that. So, you know, one nice thing about new shell is like right out of the box, you already get a really nice shell setup that doesn't require you installing some plugin uh, capability. So uh, very nice to have that. Uh, also, let me full screen this uh, buffer really quick. You can see that we got a whole nice little table of output here for all the stuff that was in this folder. And this is just from running LS. Um, you may have seen stuff like this before with something like PowerShell, but in my opinion, this is a much nicer output than what you would see from other shells that do this sort of thing. I mean, you get human readable dates and human readable sizes for files um, and all the information you would possibly need. You also get a number for the rows, which I'm guessing probably comes into play if you wanted to like quickly access a row in the output. So uh, really, you know, sort of set up well for interactivity and also being human friendly and not just something that you would try to pipe to another program. So That's right. yeah, and it, I'm guessing you probably have some kind of like default uh, output formatters that are hooked up here that do this for you. And maybe that's like something you could replace if you wanted to with uh, extension. That's right, that's right. So let's try, um, if you don't mind me, kind of just like spooling off a short little tutorial as you're typing. Sounds great. Uh, let, let's people kind of see what this looks like. So if we do a simple LS, um, you can see what the default uh, output looks like. Close that. Okay. And can we do? Yeah, perfect. So here you go. This is what an LS would look like by default. Mm -hmm. You know, it is a bit taller than you know LS from a POSIX shell, but the the columns at the top tell you what each of the uh, structured data columns are. So name, type, size, modified, and just like David was saying, the numbers on the left hand side tell you the row number. So if we wanted to grab you know, we want row 14, we could say ls pipe, so ls space pipe space, and then whatever row we want, we could say nth or nth, which is oh, uh, nice. one of the only, yeah. one of the only link, uh, words in the English language that doesn't have a vowel. Mm -hmm. And then you could just give the, the row. So if you hit enter there, that'll be the, the 14th row of the, of the data. And nice. then we can take this and turn it into something else. So if you hit the up arrow, you should get the previous thing that you typed and then pipe that. Let's say we want to see what this looks like as JSON. We could pipe this into a command called to space JSON. And it will take the same structured data and then output the equivalent JSON for that structured data. You yeah. can do CSV, you can do TOML. Yeah, we have a oh, few wow. different ones. <clears throat> nice. You need to have one for uh, S expressions. <laughs> that would be cool. Yeah, I was uh, I was chatting with David right before the stream, and I was like, oh, we should have an org mode output too. So oh, yeah. I was just I was working on one of those. So yeah, that's actually something that uh, I did not know about. I didn't even really expect that uh, JT told me that you can put in two markdown, and it would give you a markdown style table. So uh, yeah. and JT was able to, to cook up one that actually will spit out an org mode table as well. And something that uh, uh, B. Kaczynski here was saying is, um, uh, I can use table results in org babble in a traditional shell. Is it better in new shell? I'm guessing it would be somewhat better because you could possibly process it a little bit more easily. But I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure like at the boundary of org babble to shell whether it's going to make a whole lot of difference. But I'm sure we could find a way to make it better. Right. Well, let's actually take maybe if, you, if we have a minute or two, let's take a look at some of the other parts of how new shell works and you get a sense for how all this clicks together. So it's not just about LS. Um, if David wanted to, he could run PS and get the process output. And that as well will be a structured table of all your processes, the PIDs and the, you know, 
the state of of each of the processes. <laughs> and you can see how hard OBS is working. Yeah, we're, we're, um, we're eating it here. Yep. And then there's things like sys that tell you about your system. So SYS tells you about your system. And then you can go in and use this information in your scripts and whatnot. So, so it's, it's a like, lot of functionality oh, sorry, go ahead. like this. I was just saying there's a lot of functionality like this that all feeds into the structured data. Um, if you have a JSON file sitting around, do you have one? In, like, Is there any structured data in your Emacs from scratch file? Yeah, let's see. I don't have JSON here, but I do have in, let's see, let's go to project. Whoops. Come on now. Projects, oh. sites, uh, system, cc package.json. Dot JSON, come on, there we go. And I could probably just like cat that maybe, or is it some, something so else? There's a command called open that will take that file and then give you the structured data from that file. Wow, nice. Yeah. So, so basically, this works with, oh, yeah. go ahead, sorry. I was just saying this works for all the, the two slash from commands each uh, have a little uh, piece of them. So like from JSON. So this will look for those from JSON file. It's, it's a from JSON command. It says, oh, cool. I've, I'll open this file. I'll pass it into from JSON and then give you the structured data. Nice. So basically, it knows which uh, file formats are registered, and it can just automatically open that based on what you yeah. have set up in your shell. That's great. Exactly. Nice. Um, yeah, so that's also a super helpful thing where you don't need to have some external program to load up. You know, like I think that people use like JQ a lot in Bash for dealing with JSON, um, and like there's other commands for dealing with YAML, and you don't really need that because you have this, which can just give you that stuff all in a structured form already. You can start dealing with it immediately. That's right. Yeah, super useful. Uh, what else is interesting to show um, that might be relevant to the uh, what we're going to try to do? Um. So it might be relevant to what we're going to do. I think that's kind of as far as the stuff for from Emacs calling out to New Shell and then getting back out. Uh, maybe something to show folks if they want to try New Shell out for themselves. There's two commands you probably want to know about. One is called help. So if you type help, um, you can get a little introduction into how New Shell works or help space commands. And that will list all the commands that are uh, available as internal commands as part of new shell. So that's another another way that you can learn about new shell is to kind of go through the commands and see how each one of those works. Very nice. Right. And then the other one is called tutor. So if you type tutor, it'll start a kind of an interactive tutorial with you and you can follow what it says and work through different parts of the tutorial to learn how different parts of the system work. I love that. It, 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 all of a sudden, I'm getting a sense that this is like a text adventure because you type in the commands to get, get <laughs> exactly. to the next step. OK, well, don't don't get me stuck down that path because I already did one two hour live stream <laughs> doing a text adventure. Oh, uh, yeah, I love those. Uh, Aru says, have they already showed shells within shells? Well, not exactly. Um, yeah, I don't know if we're going to get that far. Well, we could. Well, let's just show really quickly. If you type shells with the plural S at the end. Yeah, this is. Um, kind of an overlay on your current shell, and you can switch between these with like other other um, parts of the system. So, for example, you could use the command enter and give it another directory, and then bounce back and forth between those two directories very easily. Wow! Right. So now type in enter or p like as or, or sorry, just the just the letter n. Yeah. Oh, okay, gotcha, yeah. I, I just have to stop for a second and say that the error messages look awesome. Oh, yeah, thanks for that. So, oh, so I basically just switched back and forth. Uh, what is this uh, in command? It's just like next, next and previous, yeah. That is pretty sweet. I like that a lot. Um, so, yeah, I like the fact that you can have, like, different shells that uh, are for different things. You don't have to run separate processes for this. Is there any way you can, like, um, send things between them, like maybe send the output of something into another shell? Yeah, it's um, the way you would do it would be, again, through composition. So you can run the shells command, and you get structured data about what shells are open. And then you could say, oh, for the nth row zeros path, you know, copy into that directory. Wow. And so you don't have to remember any of the paths. You can just make little aliases for that kind of stuff. That's really, really interesting. Yeah, I have not seen anything like that in other shells before. It's almost like having a screen built into your uh, <laughs> GNU screen built into your shell, which is awesome, or Tmux in a sense. 
Yeah, it's, it's similar to that. Yeah. Um, so let's see. There's some questions. Uh, Technomog asks, uh, can it have Vim style editing modes of the command line, or is it something even? Or is there something even better built in? Yeah, you can go. It's currently uh, Emacs by default, but you can turn Vim mode if you want the Vim bindings. Is there like a command, or do you have to do it in the configuration file? There's a yeah. There's a configuration file. Um, something if uh, folks want to play around with it. If you go to the New Shell's website, you can go to the New Shell book. And the new shell book has a section for how to configure new shell. And in that, you'll see how to configure the themes that you want. If you want the tables to have separate themes, you can look for um, how to configure the, the key bindings and, and a whole bunch of uh, different settings there. And maybe not a whole bunch for Emacs crowd, but you know what I mean. There's, there's a fair few that you can look through and, and configure. Nice. Yeah, there seems to be a lot of settings here, which is great. Cool. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, Matt Hudson says that Eden would be a great data format. That's like the, basically the closure S expression format. It's a little bit richer because mm -hmm. it has like keywords and stuff. Uh, he also asks, uh, does New Shell have HTTP, HTTPS access built in, or, or do I still need to call curl? Uh, it does. There's a command called fetch, and then you can give it a URL. And if it can detect the structure of the data coming back to you, it'll give you the structured data. Let's see. Is it, oh, it needs a HTTPS. Yeah, you need the full thing currently. I don't even know if this is a, uh, yeah. I don't know any actual re, uh, uh, API endpoints there, but it looks like it would do it, which is great. Yeah, it, it does. Yeah, for sure. And I, I I do actually use the GitHub API from New Shell, which is kind of fun. Yeah. That, you, that, that is your first thing. <laughs> yeah, it's the first thing that came to my mind. I don't know. There's probably other more easy APIs to try to access. Uh, let's see. Um, Scott, Scott Haley says, I announced my presence. Hey, Scott, nice to see you. <laughs> uh, I've been using Stump WM recently, and I sort of kind of like it. Well, that's good. We'll talk about that uh, in some, some videos in the future, I think. It should be pretty fun. Uh, Vitor says, wondering about new shell error messages in case uh, input file contains any syntax errors. Um, let me try. Let's see. The, the best way to do this, I think, is to try to add a comment to a JSON file, because I think I tried to read one before, and new shell didn't like it. So let's take a look at that real quick. Uh, yeah. sorry, projects, code, system crafters, what is it? Oh, and package.json. Let me just throw a uh, comment, which is not valid here. Boom. And then jump back to vterm and then say open and then right arrow. Oh, weird. What folder was I looking at? Projects. Oh, did I go to? Sure. Oh, I went the wrong place. That's why. Projects, sites, systemcrafters.cc. That's the right one. Package.json. All right, now let's put it here. <laughs> You're going to have all these comments in your JSON files after the stream. Yeah, I'm going to wonder why things are all broken. All right, so let's try <laughs> this. Can I open file? Oh, I keep typing the wrong stuff. Well, we in go. this one, it didn't seem to yeah, cause we... a problem. Yeah, in some in some um, for JSON comments is one we use a package that's more forgiving than the strict JSON format because it's so com common to have comments in your JSON file. But other like if you have a slightly broken input file, it's going to try its best. Um, it may give you an error message, like a really general error message that says, "There you go." Like line two has something broke. Go figure it out. Yeah, uh, it good. would be nice to yeah do something better in the future. Yeah, it was at least it says it could not parse JSON trailing characters at line two, column one. I mean, that's yeah, that's good enough that you can go into that file and then find out where it's a problem. So I guess the um, accuracy of this depends on the parser that you're using uh, internally that will tell you about the line numbers where the errors are. But uh, at least for JSON, it's, it seems like it works great. Yeah. Crazy Chicken says, holy heck, there really are a lot of built-ins for the shell. Yeah, that's sort of the point, <laughs> I think, is like, you know, you want it to be more useful than Bash or Z shell out of the box, because otherwise, what's the point, really? You know, it's just another shell. Yeah. One of the nice things, too, we didn't really mention this at the beginning, is that it's cross-platform. So you can just get used to it in Linux. And if you have to pop over to Windows, jump right back into it, and you're, you're pick up where you left off. Yeah, that's a huge benefit, um, especially for people who use Emacs on multiple platforms because if you get used to using Bash on Linux or on uh, Mac OS and you use that from within Emacs, then you jump to Windows and you don't have your shell anymore. I mean, one right. way that we deal with that in the Emacs world is to use eShell, but eShell is not um, powerful enough to be like a full shell 
in all cases. I would say new shell is way, way more powerful. And if it can do cross platform by default, then there's a better chance that you could have a more consistent workflow across platforms uh, by using it. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Matt Hudson says, I use extra fields for comments. Oh, is that in JSON? That's actually a pretty good idea. Uh, Scott Haley says, how do you and JT know each other? Did you work together at uh, M uh, whatever? Yes. Yeah, there, there's, there's, yes, we did. There, there's a, <laughs> a, a big company that uh, exists in the world, and JT and I both worked there at some point in time. Okay, so uh, Matt says, can you store transformation chains to use with different data sources? Yes, you can alias a pipeline that you can apply later that's or badass. create custom commands that do the pipeline for you. Yeah, now that, that sounds really useful. If, if you have a thing that you do very commonly to try to process some output, you don't need to make a full alias that locks everything in. You can just send any commands output through that. So if you're dealing with JSON files quite often, like let's say you, know, you use uh, package.json files, you can write some custom code for that um, and just have a little alias for that that you could pipe things through, which would be pretty cool. Um, all right, so how about we, is there anything else you think would be interesting to, to cover? No, let's jump in. I'm ready to get, get project going. All right, so I, I'm going to stay in New Shell here and do the things I need to do. Uh, first of all, I'm going to try to go to, does I still have that open? No. So I'm going to go to my GitHub, and I've created a repo for um, what we're going to do today. Actually, let's not do that. Let's do this. I think I saw it in my... Uh, github.com slash David Wheel slash uh, Emacs new shell. So I've created a repo where I'm going to check in what we do today. Uh, probably you're going to see my video get a little bit choppy now. Anytime I try, try to start loading up pages, things just start choking. All right. So this is uh, David Wheel slash Emacs dash new shell. I'm going to use, um, let's, let's use n here and go down one level, get clone, um, get at github.com, David Wheel slash Emacs dash new shell. And then, whoops, okay, got to type in my passphrase. And then um, Emacs new shell. And now here, let's just type in Emacs new shell el. So what I want to try to do is uh, start working on a simple Emacs package that can take the output of a, a new shell command through Emacs client. So we're going to have to like have Emacs running in server mode and then pipe it through to Emacs client. And then uh, Emacs should be able to take that information and then display it in a tabulated list view, which is a feature that I think only is in Emacs 27 and higher. So if you have Emacs 26, you may not be able to use this just yet. Uh, Matt asks, can you, oh no, we already got that one. Uh, but now you're, you're getting congratulations on the progress of New Shell. Uh, sounds pretty neat. Thanks. So let's see. Um, uh, James says, uh, does new shell support abbreviations like fish shell does? Uh, similar the aliasing allows you to squeeze like a command and some flags into a, a much smaller command name. So you do get something similar to abbreviations. Nice. So I think maybe the, the, the most pragmatic way to start doing this is to try and send some stuff through to, uh, to to Emacs from new shell just by using Emacs client and then start try to, trying to build up some code around it because I don't exactly know yet how to write the code that we need to write. We're going to try to do this live and see what we can do. Um, so let's say maybe I wanted to just do, well, is there anything here from LS? Okay, so I can do LS to JSON and I could probably just pipe that through to Emacs client and I believe it's dash E. Um, let's see. Maybe, so is there a way to like, well, I wonder if I could just do this myself. Yeah, that's probably not going to work. Oh, it did work. Okay. I'm, I'm using Vim editing in, in the shell, but it's from Emacs that actually did that. So that, I'm glad it worked. So uh, I want to look at the Emacs client dash dash help output. I need to use dash E for eval. Um, I could do a normal editor, but... I'm not sure what's going to happen with that. I would have to set up a package that could take. Yeah, it would need to. We need to write it out to the file first, and then pass it into Emacs. But I think we'd be better off if we try to pass it in directly. So if we could pass the string through eval, and let's say I write a function here, defun. Um, uh, let's see, new slash um, display output. 
and then we give it a output string. And then what we'll do here is, um, let's see, which one can we use for that? With current buffer. Yeah, so we'll use with current buffer. And I think there's a function called uh, get buffer create. Check that out real quick. Yeah, get buffer create. And then we'll create a buffer called uh, new shell output for now, just to see what we can do with that. And then we'll drop down one line and then um, I can try to delete the contents of the buffer. Let's see, delete region point min uh, point max. So just to clear the buffer out if we already have it there. And then I can try to insert the output string just to pull that in. I'm going to save this or eval this. And now let's try to, did I, yeah, cool. I saved that. Let's try to run that. So I'm going to try to do um, uh, new slash display output. And how do I get the value of the thing coming from the pipeline in the next command? So you can do a string interpolation. It's probably the way I would do it. So in front of the quote, put a dollar sign. Oh, so you, mean, you can even do like that. Uh, in of the outer quote. Oh, okay. Here. Okay, great. Makes sense. Yeah. And of course, the first thing I notice is that you have parens, and that's that's how string interpolation works. Uh, so sorry, um, escape those. Yeah, escape them is going to be a little tricky. You'll say, uh, per, hold on. Can I type it to you? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, all right. It would be char. Paren char and then L paren. Something like that. There might be a smaller way to, of typing that. Oh. So, okay, I see what you're saying. So, oops, let's see what I do there. All right, so here, it would need to be char uh, L paren. Yeah, I like think that. LP might be the short version. Let's try it yeah. and see what happens. All right, so now we're going to go here, delete these slashes, and say char uh, rp, I, I suppose what it would yeah, be. Yeah, there you go. And uh, escaping, let's see. Yeah. You don't need to escape those. Yeah, you're fine. Oh, really? Okay, great. That's cool. Uh, am I lying? I'm probably lying. Well, we'll find out. <laughs> um, error finding named character. Let's try uh, l paren then in this case. Char l paren. Oops, there we go. End of file during parsing. I wonder if okay, it's the, so the quotes. Um, yeah, the quotes. So let's uh, do a slash there. And a slash. Can you do uh, single ticks, or does it have to be double double um, quotes? I don't know. Let's try it this way first. Okay, so shell C syntax error in your unexpected token. Which one don't you like? Oh, uh, what? Oh, oh, I have not put the. Uh, the text in yet, and I'm putting this in the wrong place. That's what's happening. Let me just delete this. Whoa. Uh, my my evil key bindings, my vim, vim key bindings are fighting with what's going on inside of the shell right now. So, all right, so now I'm gonna do slash, and then the care r paren needs to be here. And then inside of the quotation marks, we need to figure out what the, um, the string is that's coming through the pipeline. All right. So is there like a like a dollar or something that I can put in, or uh, what I put in for that? Oh yeah, you would type dollar i n, and that's I like a character that means take what's coming in from the stream, and use that as the input. Um, put that in parens, so it's like another one of those things that's evaluated. So uh, as part of the string interpolation, like this. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, Vitaly says it's hard to see the commands. Is it because it's, they're wrapping, or because the text is too small? into file during parsing let me uh see text scale increase what do i have that bound to boom that's a little bit bigger is that better now i'll make this taller actually actually can we do this in in parts just so we can see the like the emacs client we can do that as like the next step if we can get the string interpolation to be printing out what you want then we can send that on okay um, so let me see if I can try to organize the screen a little bit better because people are having a hard time. Whoops. Wow. Okay. 
those of you watching the stream right now are enjoying me um, clicking the wrong thing and moving the entire screen around. That's great. Here we go. I'm going to put this right here. Cool. So uh, JT can lord over the chat. Okay. <laughs> so uh, now, um, yeah, there you go. You're the billboard. So what you were saying um, to, to try without the... Um, yeah, let's try with, without the Emacs client just so we can make the string that we want. Gotcha. And see if that string is looking like we want it to, to look and then we'll send that on to emacs client that's a great idea okay so new display output um okay so we have quotes inside of the json we may need to escape those somehow mm. yeah that's tricky that is tricky what is the best way to do this i wonder kodak black says you can use single quotes if it helps uh let's try it and see what it does i don't know uh if if well hold on wait no not that let's do let's see that there wonder. but also do single quote and see if that works here ah uh, okay so we've got no that's not right i think i must have cleared it yeah you can for i just tried it you can do dollar sign single tick instead of double quotes if that helps you and then i don't think you have to escape the quotes on the inside okay so Oh, oh, okay. Gotcha, gotcha. So you're basically you're saying do dollar single tick here. Yeah. And then on the outside, that would be even better than I think. Ugh. Hit enter too early. All right. So let me go back and fix all of this. Um, um yeah. single quote or double quote and then double quote again. But I wonder if we're still gonna hit issues because of the the we still have that. Out. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. How would we, oh yeah, we would have to escape all that anyways. Let me see if there is a, a, an escaping mechanism that we can use real quick. Cool, sounds good. Uh, Victor says, hello, I just want to say that after a dozen years talking, taking very unsophisticated notes with the org, I finally made the jump, thanks to you. Uh, that's awesome, it's great to hear that. Thanks for letting nice. me know. A lot of people who have been uh, uh, looking into Emacs for a long time and uh, finally getting their way through it recently which is great let's see i guess the question would be would there be another format that would be better for this too if json is going to be too much of a problem because of the mm. um, quotation marks i guess anything that's meant to be read by a programming language is going to end up having quotation marks in it right I, I was wondering about, you You were showing off the two markdown. There's like a pretty version of markdown that's really close to org mode. I wonder if that would help at all. Yeah, interesting idea. If I could take it into an org buffer and then maybe read the entries somehow. Mm. OK, let me show you this as well. I'll send this on to you one sec. Okay, so to JSON, find store, replace all. Okay, I, I wonder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Let's try that. That sounds like a good idea. So you can you can take the dollar sign in and then pipe it into um, the stir find replace all. Instead of doing it earlier in the pipeline? Yeah, like in place there That's in cool. the string itself. Yeah. So let's you see. can just kind of pipe that in and, and convert it to be doesn't like my yeah. syntax. Let's see. You need a I'm, pipe between yeah. the dollar sign in and yeah. I can't even see my character. This, <laughs> this set of colors is killing me. I know. That's pretty wild. Where is even your cursor? Ooh. There we go. Yeah, I know. I was having a really hard time <laughs> discerning that. <clears throat> okay, so uh, we want to replace all. Is that going to escape them automatically? Or should I put yeah, an escape? Oh, wow. Yeah, you might want to do this as multiple steps now that you point that out. Yeah, yeah. So, so maybe I'll just drop it as another uh, step in the pipeline. Yeah, that would be great. Uh, I can't even get back to the top. Let me just do we're this. doing it live, folks. Yeah, we're doing, doing it, live. it live. And I'm also making tons of mistakes because uh, my evil key bindings do not work well ugh, inside of uh, VTerm. Maybe that's why. So I ended up when I was using VTerm, I stopped using evil mode because of it. Yeah, you know, I should. I do ended that. up just like going back to Emacs. Uh, Emacs key bindings. 
Yeah, I probably should be just using the plain old key bindings. All right, so let's take all that out, get back to in, and then yep. jump here, add another pipe character maybe, um, and then I'll copy this text one more time. Yep. Copy that, just drop it right in, right there. And um, I think that go. should be good. Okay, so. I still don't see it escaping. No, I wonder if I should put the escape character here. Oh yeah, you need it there. Yeah. Okay, great. That works. So so that's just one little extra step, but it's great that we already have all that functionality in the language. You don't have to reach for some out, uh, external command for that. All right, so now if I call Emacs client with that, that should work. I'll try it this time. So I'm mm -hmm. I'm taking mental notes as you're doing it to think, oh, you know, as we're improving new shell, I wonder if the string interpolation should allow you to use a, a raw paren and like yeah, it would be nice if there was some way to escape those and, and throw them in. Okay, another end yeah, file sure. with parsing. What am I missing here? So there's an open quote, and all of these are escaped correctly. What if I do this myself? What if I try to evaluate this inside of Emacs and not... Um, hmm. Come on now. Look, look at me using the mouse like a noob. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm ashamed of myself right now. Let's, okay, Ugh. I'm going to paste this in. Uh, well, it didn't seem to do anything. I'm wait, come on, let's put it here. All right, so display output something just happened, it flashed for a second with current buffer. Okay, you know, I need to actually open a buffer with that. Um, I think it's like switch the buffer, switch to buffer. Come on, let's go switch the buffer, buffer or name. Okay, and that's a uh, current buffer. Eval that. Let me do this. Okay. So now we at least we have the um, the text coming in, which is great. Nice. And from the command line, it still doesn't want to work, but it must be because of something that's reading wrong. Um, it's really weird. Should should I? Oh, you know what? Maybe I need to put. So this um, syntax is oh, that, actually... that dollar sign needs to be escaped. I bet the dollar sign. You think so? I wonder. Let me think for a second. So, when we spit that out, it actually doesn't spit it out with. Um, so we need to have uh, we need to have quote, sorry we need to have quotation marks around the whole thing. I think. Right. I'm thinking. Do we need to have like two levels of quote escaping in that case because we're gonna have wow. to put quotes quotes around it again? I mean, you could in where it says dollar sign single tick, you could put a you could try putting a quote right on the inside of that. And at the very end to see if that does it. Ah, okay. So let's try that. That's a good idea. All right, right there. And then yep. right, right here. The that that sounds like the right approach. Come on, come on, come on. Why is it jumping so much? Jeez. Okay. Symbols value as variable is void. Uh, let's let's take a look at what that looks like on the output. Cause I think we do need another level of escaping, unfortunately. Because we have here the open uh, quotation mark and then another one here that is not escaped. So this needs to be escaped and probably everything else needs to be doubly escaped, which is a nightmare. Oh my goodness. Uh, let's okay. see. You know, I'm starting to wonder if uh, all bugs will be solved soon in Jesus' name. Yeah, we, we may need uh, <laughs> the help from the big J here soon. I, I was wondering if, um, if from Emacs... Can, would it make more sense to call out to new shell from Emacs and see if we can just redirect the standard in and standard out and then parse what the output is coming from new shell? We could definitely do that. Um, but I mean, so if we went with a completely different tack where the idea is that from within Emacs, you can just have a, a new shell command string and then run it and get the output back out. That could be one way, but it feels less interesting to me than actually being in new shell and being able to send something to Emacs and see it right. pop up. So right, right. I, I want to try to make that work if possible. I'm trying to show we mm -hmm. you want to try your double escaping so we can update that string find replace to do slash 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 quote. <laughs> yeah, okay. That's the right way to do it. That's good. So let's do this first. And then we may need to take this string and then post process it the same way. Well, hold on. If we're gonna, you could manually do it in that one, I think, and just put the slash. Um, yeah. Like, 
around the the dollar sign in where you have the quotes 100 percent. okay so let's do is it right here right oops yeah there cool that one and then the other one maybe question that mark looks right to me so now let's that try to run it early but yeah, maybe, it, <laughs> maybe it'll work you know this is this is the hell we live with um <laughs> emacs client dash e uh what fascinating did, did it break the lines and then do multiple prints what is what is happening <laughs> i have no idea <laughs> okay let's see let me think of, see if i can understand what's happening um why did it print four lines it's putting new display output before all of them. What command did it think and it, it ran? And it's each of the... Uh, that's, that's really weird. So, okay. So that's not broken. Okay. That didn't seem to have any effect. Um, and it only happened after we added this part. Yeah, I wonder if taking just that one out. Is there, is there put a new line in somehow? It's seeing something in the string as a variable that's coming from that date field. Oh, okay. And I'm trying to figure out how does, I don't know the Emacs stuff well enough to just stare at that and know if anything would parse as a variable. Ah, interesting idea here supercube says uh slash 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 n is being treated as a new oh, line oh nice but where because right oh, it has a quote before that yeah, so maybe i would think that that would prevent it but yeah okay that was good 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 call supercuber um let's see yeah i'm not i'm not catching what the problem is here if it's something, yeah. let's see. So it breaks after license, but in the print, there's no quote in the four lines. Can we try just the Emacs client without the JSON pieces to it and make sure that we can send stuff up into Emacs client from new shell? Yeah, let me get the output we had before. Um, not that one. Well, okay, let's, let's, let's jump back to what we were doing previously. Um, here, let's do this. Purple G says this is bananas. Well, they're probably uh, very old and brown bananas at this point. Um, <laughs> I don't know what that's supposed to mean. So let's see, new display output. So here, let's do this. Maybe I'll try to read this. Oh, wait, hold on. I see this right here. There's something. This is not escaped. Yeah, it's not escaped in the input string either. Enrico says in the output there is a slash t also for type. Yeah, I think I think something's getting eaten, but I, I believe now that something is going on right here. Like there's a quotation mark that doesn't have an escape in front of it. Um, is it? Oh, is these? That can't be right because this is one we want. So it's right at the beginning of the JSON. Oh, did we not fix that? I think we did, and then we took it out while we were debugging. All right, so now that's right again. So here's what I want to do. I want to go and grab this whole string without the outside quotes and see if uh, if Emacs likes it. Well, I guess that here. Let's uh, do a little bit of uh, lispiness. I can't move that to the end. Give me a break. OK, I'll pull it again. Okay, so now what I want to do is, is I think there's a read function, read, yeah, read. Let's just read this and see what it comes back as. So pull up the message buffer. Come on, control H, E, thank you. Went to the wrong place as usual. Okay, so the output was new display output. We have an open quotation mark as expected. All these look escaped relatively correctly. Um, let's yeah, see. Yeah, it seems okay. Rosario says, uh, isn't the comma? Hmm. So if I take, 
That's really strange. I don't get it. Can we try the um like a simpler message and send that up into yeah, that's good Emacs idea. client? So maybe like without all the JSON in it? Yeah, kind of just like a hello world to make sure that that's working. Good idea. All right. So let's do um can I just do like straight up hello world without anything yeah. else? Okay. Yeah. Emacs client. Oops. Emacs client dash E. Um and then we will say dollar single quote, double quote, uh, new slash display output. And we need to fix the the actual parens here. So I need to do what was it? The yeah, uh, oh, char car l paren right yeah. there, and then the car r paren. It's almost like I need to start putting this into an alias because it's starting to get a little bit gross. Yeah, it to is. do this repeatedly. And uh, display output, we need a, we need that, and then we need uh, was it um, dollar in into file during parsing. Let's take out the Emacs client bit. Need a quotation mark before the last. Yeah, thanks. Let's see. You're probably right about that actually. Um. Yes, you're right. I'm missing this one. Thank you, Supercuber. See, this is why it's good to have people watching over your shoulder. <laughs> I know. Whenever it's you're like uh, parent programming with you know a bunch of people at the same time. This is total mob programming. It's great. So um, now, Emacs client dash e into file during parsing. Man, Emacs client, what's your problem? Seriously. Yeah, what's going on here? Give us, give us at least a better error here. Is there anything in Emacs client that says about how the input is interpreted. Comma is not interpreted as back quote. Oh, I can't be right though. This is inside of a string. Uh, I mean, I suppose it could be, but Enrico says comma is not interpreted as back quote. I don't think so because it's inside of a string. It shouldn't be getting interpreted as a, as a back quote. And even in this case where we've, um, yeah, there's no comma in this string and it still has a problem. So. Here, how about this? Just paste it in. Yeah. It, it added a new line on its own there. Okay, so that worked. Something about piping it is causing a problem. I don't know if it's picking up mm -hmm. some extra stuff. What else could it be? And even uh, this, let's see, this whole string. Let's try that and see if it actually works just directly. So um, Emacs client dash E and then paste this in. Uh, shall see syntax error near unexpected token open paren. Oh, that's really strange. Yeah, that is pretty strange. And it's got a slash here as if it's a new line. Um, let's see, why do you need the D quotes around the whole thing, by the way? Because uh, Emacs client, I think it needs to take it as a string. So if we were to try that directly, Emacs client dash E um, new slash display output test. I don't think this is going to work. I think it's going to be a problem because new shell is going to try to interpret that. So we actually have to have quotation marks around it. And if we do that, we have to uh, put a slash around those quotation marks to escape it. But in this case, it didn't actually work. Yeah. Slash, in, the, slash, slash. in New Shell, there's actually, <laughs> there's no escaping in strings in New Shell, which is why we were doing the uh, the string interpolation before with the dollar sign, because that allows you to, to call commands from inside of the string as you process it. Mm -hmm. Syntax error near unexpected token. Yeah, so there's the the slashes won't um, they'll just get passed along. Uh, I'm sorry. So you're saying that the 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 forward slashes here or whatever that is backslashes. Yeah. yeah, we don't actually support that kind of um, escaping because it can be confused for Windows uh, Windows path separator. Yeah. So uh, Ashraz brings up a good point. Aren't those sh errors? I mean, I guess are we like are we running these programs as shell commands uh, under the covers and maybe there's like some translation that's going on there that's a problem yeah i was i was thinking about that so 
New Shell, when you're running in Linux, will run through SH for most things, which gives you access to some of the SH built-ins you wouldn't otherwise have access to. Uh, we may be tripping over some kind of hiccup in that translation when we're trying to do all these quotes and, and escapes and all that kind of stuff. Ah, um, okay, so uh, Mini KN says, uh, but you can use single quotes for dash E. Well, it turns out you can, and that yeah. deals with the issue of the quotation marks. So let's try that then with uh, a full example. If I were to go back, uh, let's see, to this one maybe, and then um, use a single quote here, go back to double quote on this one. Use single quote here. Um, yep, that should be good. And then this doesn't need escapes anymore. Okay, so what? It didn't pass it along. So you've got double quotes on the outside and double quotes on the inside. So you may need to use something like, um, here, let me send this to you. Oh, so maybe I could still then Okay, so if I if I s escape these single quotes, yeah, there's no care, okay. Care D quote. Okay, all right, cool. So let's try that actually. Care D quote. All right, so let's do that. No, that's not what I wanted. I think I wanted um, still this, but here I think right. Yep, that's where I think it might work. We're gonna figure it out, folks. <laughs> one mistake at a time yeah go. this is pretty epic trying to trying to juggle through emacs through new shell through sh back through emacs what is happening wow whoa, 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 whoa. so i pressed up and it forgot oh probably because it got stuck so how did it get stuck here so ah because i made a mistake that's why let's copy this whole thing Now, um, I forgot to change. No, I forgot to end that, that string. There you go. Still, though, like, what is it doing? It doesn't seem to invoke the command. It just writes it out. Yeah, I'm not sure. That's interesting. Yeah, I'm very confused. Okay, so let's see if anybody else has some nice suggestions in the chat. Yeah, um, so I'll take this. Yeah, I've already done something like that, basically. That works. So it, it must, well, this also works because of, see, so in new shell, dollar single quote can produce multi, multiple arguments if the result contains spaces, is that true? Um, I don't think so. If it's all inside of a quote, I don't think so. I'm kind of thinking of we might want to work around the bash slash sh intermediate step by writing out to say like a temporary file and then having Emacs slurp in from a temporary file. Yeah, this, that's where my head is going at this moment. I'm gonna try one last thing. I'm gonna try to see if I can pass this through like this. So Emacs client dash E um, and then uh, just drop in the in, right? Yeah, you don't even need the string interpolation there. Okay. You can just say dollar sign in. Oh, right, okay. Yeah, that's very weird. So that should work, but yeah, there's there's something not being invoked correctly. I wonder if um, I have no idea what this could even be. Like, why why in a pipeline does it not work when it works fine as a normal command line command? Well, that may be just like an edge case that we've now hit in in new shell that has never been encountered yeah. before. Um, okay, so the next step then try to go through an intermediate file. But uh, what I wonder is, can we still do that? So Victor says it's being evaluated as a string. Uh, oh, you're right, Victor. That's right. It's being evaluated as a string somehow. So Emacs is taking that as a string input, and it's not evaluating it as an expression. 
And why is so that the you, case? Yeah, if you just ran that, why? How is that different? I don't I wonder. Know. But it's definitely. I bet you. I bet you. What New Shell is doing is escaping those ticks for you, mm -hmm. and that is causing Bash to hand it. Uh, oh. Yeah, there probably is some some kind of quirk like that where it is handing Emacs something that's slightly different than what you see, because it's passing through Bash and trying to convert it so Bash understands what it is. Supercube says, uh, Supercuber says, it, in New Shell, okay, so because if not, then you shouldn't need uh, dollars, single quote stuff, just do dollar stuff. I think it's because of what I said, it might be wrong. Um, Kaya says, when the command uh, works as being read with single quote, but it prints without the quotation mark, I think that's related. Yeah, it's definitely related. I mean, this is definitely being interpreted as a string by Emacs and it's printing it out the output as a string. Uh, so that is clear now for sure. So it's just a matter of how the translation is happening. I, I want to, are you game to try something while we're poking around? Let's do it. Um, take the line one up from where you're at, the one that was outputting the string. Yeah. Oh, this? Uh, like the, the whole pipeline? Yeah. 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 Oh, what am I doing with Hello World there? Okay, cool. That's fine. Let's, let's go with that. It, yeah, it's fine for now, I think, probably. And then I'll paste it in. All right. Yeah, paste it in. Let's edit before we send it. Take the single ticks out from around the, the edges. Mm, okay. So that and the other one. And then let New Shell put them in for you. Watch it work now. Ha ha. You're right. Nice. Okay, so we finally got it working, at least enough to the point where we can pass something in. So now if we go back to what we were doing earlier, uh, let's see, we were opening thrashing around terribly oh my gosh. there we go here we are just these things and who knows which one was the the correct one after all i think this is probably a good enough starting point yeah so it seems like the winner was to create the string first and then um invoke emacs yeah. and let let new shell do the rest okay so it sounds like all right, so I'm going to drop this right there and then go back and delete the Hello World junk at the beginning. All right, into file during parsing. Let me just double check what, if I'm not doing anything wrong here. So to JSON, let's take this off and see what it says. All right, so it's giving me the whole thing. I wonder if we even need that extra slashing at this point. Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering. We may not need that extra slash. So let's go back and take the, uh... okay, so now it's printing it as a string again. And I think, um... and then, mm -hmm. then try that. Oh, and we, there was another thing that we had done as well. We passed this through to Emacs client. Oh, okay. Right. We, we haven't uh, edited the whole thing yet in the file during parsing. So new display output. And the hello world string we saw above was written verbatim like that. So in theory, this should be fine unless new shell is putting double quotes around this whenever it sends it through. Mm, it may be. So, uh, yeah, but I would think that that would have broken our simple hello world example as well. Yeah. We never had any nested, um, quotation marks in there. If I can try to mm. add some, let's see. Let's say let's, let's be a little cheeky and call it a, a world in quotation marks because you know it doesn't okay. feel like a world right now. Okay, we still have uh, an issue. Right. So we can't do escapes and strings like that. We'll need to do the string interpolation. Okay. Well, since we've already burned an entire hour <laughs> on trying to get this to work, maybe we should try another approach. So I'll tell you what I'm worried about with the with the, the approach of doing a temporary file or sorry, a, yeah. an intermediate file. Like if you have a, a pipeline. So let's say you were able to, you know, do the LS uh, through JSON. This is just pseudocode uh, to a file. And then somehow you need to still like through this pipeline, be able to invoke Emacs client with the name of that file after you write it out. Is there a way to write a file and then get the name of the file out of that and send it through the pipeline? Mm. Let me see if there's a way to get temporary file names real easily. Yeah, that'd be nice. Uh, da, da, da. I mean, because once we get the data coming into Emacs, we were all good. I think we we're we'll be able to do a lot of stuff. Yeah. Actually, there's a, a command in um, 
a command in Linux, or at least in, in Mint, that's temp file. Mm -hmm. And then we can probably set a suffix. So if we want to save it as uh, like a JSON, well, it doesn't really matter. We don't have to, on the Emacs side, it doesn't need to know it's JSON. We'll just tell it it's JSON. Well, maybe, let's see. Let me think about this for a second. Uh, so we're going to like create a temporary file or like uh, set a variable containing a temporary file path before we start running the command. Or is there, is there a way we can do it all through one pipeline without having to like set up anything in advance? Yeah, hold on. Let me, I'll send you a little idea. Okay. Let me, let me just double check to make sure it's going to work. All right. In the meantime, I'll take a look at the chat, see if we missed anything here. Marduk says, hello there. I got the notification a little late. Yeah, who knows, man. Uh, YouTube, they're not very reliable on notifications. Sometimes you'll send a notification, say, the stream's in 30 minutes, and it's like five minutes before. <laughs> That's how it goes. Uh, George Vafthiadis says, uh, how about to base64 the input and use base64 decode string on the Emacs side? Uh, it's not a bad idea, actually, if we can base64 encode the whole thing um, to avoid I believe the, we can. Yeah, the, the, avoid the quoting problems. Uh, Purple G says, you can use make temp D to create and return an entire temporary directory. Yeah, that's also a possibility. Okay. Um, I like the idea about base64 encoding because uh, that will get rid of all the nested quotation marks. So how do I how would I go about doing that with two base64? Yeah, if you do, um, uh, let me see what this is. Base64 hash base64 base64 encoded decoded value. Yeah, so there's a command called hash space base64. And we'll pass. Let me put the. Uh, uh, let's see. Hello. Cool. And then, and then how, how do you yeah. how do you decode it after that? Okay. Yeah. Just run help on hash base sixty four and see if um, right. comes up. Okay. Oh, yeah. Decode. Dash dash decode. Ah, nice. Yeah. Okay. So if I take uh, that and run it through hash base sixty four decode. Okay. Good. I think we're good to go on that. Nice. Um. Okay, so what I'll do... You want to try it that way? Yeah, let's try it that way. I think it's a great idea. Thank you very much, uh, George, for the idea. Yeah, that's great. Um, let's see. I wonder how long that string is going to get with larger data sets. It's going to get kind of insane, probably. We, we may end up having to do a temporary file at some point, I think. Um, so let's go to this one. In this case, we can probably even avoid doing the find and replace. Yep. And then we'll still have the command string here, but what we'll do is run it through hash uh, base 64 and then pass it through the command here. New display, new display output. Um, KRD quote. Blah, 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 blah. Let's see what it does. Okay, so nice. we got it. Great. So we have a base64 string. This looks a lot like a uh, OAuth token. I know. <laughs> I was trying, I, trying not to have flashbacks. Yeah, I work. know. Like I see E, Y, J. I'm like, oh, that's a token. I just uh, <laughs> I dox myself. All right, here we go. So, whoops. Um, in the code here, there is a decode base. Oh, base64 decode string. So let's pull that. And I'll do that on this string. Base64 decode string. Drop that back there. And then, boom, there we go. We have JSON. And now, nice. if I were to then, um, let's see, what is it? Uh, JSON read, yeah, it's just, read string, JSON read string. So JSON read string, and then throw that there. And then once again, go back to the shell and run that. Wrong number of arguments, JSON read string. Okay, so it didn't like what I did there. Let's see what I missed. Oh, at point? Okay, can I like, you seriously want me to have this in a temp buffer just to read it? That's insane. <laughs> Okay, JSON string, JSON S string, J JSON, is it going to be decode? Let's see, D 
decode a string. No. So you have an encode but no decode. Gotcha. All right. So um, hmm. Read from string. Thank you. There we go. Read. That's gotta be it. From string. And we'll do control X there. Let me save this file. Uh, wrong type argument care or string P. Oh, okay. So it's insert. It doesn't like the fact that I'm trying to do an insert. Well, that's fine because we're at the point now where uh, we want to try to write things out. In fact, I think I can just use format maybe and then see if that writes it out as S expression in the buffer. Boom. Okay. So now we have S expressions. Um, these are being treated as symbols, which is a little bit weird, unless it's just the way that it's writing it out. Those must be strings. That's weird. Okay. Yeah, that should be a string. So now we're at the point where we can finally try to use this uh, tabulated list view. And um, what we probably want to do is try to infer. See, that's, that's a, an interesting thing here. We, need, we have to infer the columns from the... Um, the keys that are in the first item. So let's just try to do that really quickly. So maybe what I'll do is do a little, um, maybe let's make a new function. Define um, new uh, process input. We'll come up with better names at some other point. Uh, let's see, input, hold on. JSON, um, no. Input. It's like a row yeah. and then get the header cell or something. Yeah. So at this point, I've got the entire data set. So if I want to process the input, what I want to try to do is grab the columns first and then, well, I guess process input is a bad name. Let's say, how about we do this? Infer, ah, Lispy is killing me. All right. Infer columns, um, row. So then, um, see, I want to do a map car. I think, let me double check the parameter order function and sequence, it's lambda um, call. And then I wanna get the car of the column. And then for the row there, okay. So let's eval that, come on now. All right, so now I should be able to pull the columns from the first row. So, if I, let's just do a let here. I'll move it around somewhere else later. So rows. Nova Leary says, I just witnessed someone throwing their 3D printer against a wall. It was so sad. It sounds like something out of Office Space. Maybe it's like I just the, saw that. Yeah. <laughs> Office Space for, uh, for 2021. And it all takes place at your own home because we can't leave. So let's see here. Um... So we need to take the JSON read from string, mm -hmm. pull that there, and then inside we can also, let's do a let star, drop down, call, we'll see. Mm, yeah, let's call it columns. New slash infer columns. Take the car of the rows. And then, uh, yeah, let's just like insert the columns into the buffer just to get a little bit of a readout on what the information is. Nice. We'll say calls. And then I still want the delete region and then still want to switch the buffer. So control X, save the file. Now let's go back to new shell and then run it again. List P license. So what did that output look like? I'm going to write it out real quick as a message. Message. Um, maybe I want to get the, the rows. Let's get the rows first and write that out. Yeah, license would be one of the values instead of the keys. This makes me think it's looking at the wrong, wrong piece of it. That's really weird if this is the case map car maybe mapping over the wrong thing. So let's see, whoops. Let's go back here and run that again. Did I reevaluate that? Yeah, let me, I think I've screwed up. Oh, and let's go to, ah, uh, hmm. Message buffer. I'm not getting any output there. So I want to write message rows, but maybe wrong. 
Oh, okay. So infer columns is a place where it's choking at this point. So let me just comment that out and just do a empty list. Reval. Okay, nil. That's really helpful. But uh, what about the message buffer? Okay. Well, you know, that is of just this is a fine a list i don't know why it's having trouble but oh no okay hold on a second it's not because we were saying license instead of name i wonder why uh this is this is one item it's not a list of of items it's a single item where it has its key value pairs as the list so i'm, I'm not treating it the right way and i wonder mm -hmm. if you have a list of files uh, will it actually give me the output in a different way? So, for instance, let's say we go to, whoops, what do I do here? Let's go to vterm, and then um, I'm going to touch a file, touch a test. Now we have two files here. Let's run this one more time. And now we have a vector of a lists. So whenever... So it looks like whenever you do JSON output, whenever it has only a single item, it writes it as a single item. Otherwise, it writes it out as a list of items. Uh, is there a way yep. it, at the command line that we might be able to force it to write it? Let's check um, uh, the help maybe. That's actually, that's a fix that's coming into an upcoming version of New Shell, but it's not in there yet. Yeah, I think that's something that would be helpful for you, like, you know, consistent data processing. But yeah, we might totally. be able to... Here's what I can do. I can I can also infer whether it's a list or an item by looking at it, whether it's a cons. Well, no, I can't do that because it's. I can check to see if the uh, cutter of the cons pair is also a list, but that's. All right, let's do that. Let's do that. Is there is there a way to have like a reflections over the type to see if the type is a list or not? Um. Well. Let's see. List p. Non nil and only if a list is an A list with simple keys. Okay. Maybe that's enough. I can use this JSON A list if I can get it to show up in the right place. Um, helpful. Whoops, that's not the right one. I want uh, A list. Okay. Firefox. Come on now. Uh, Ashra says list P. This is just plain old. Let's look for symbol. List P. Okay. A cont cell or nil. So yeah, it's it's that's the problem with list p is because it's gonna if it's just a cont cell. Let's let's try that out. How about this? I'm gonna run eval list p cons one and nil. It says t, so it's, it it treats it as a list even though it's n well okay that that could still be a list. Hold on a second. Cons one and two. It still says T, so that's it's not reliable enough. I think um, array P. Well, array P is probably checking for an actual array and not a list, I would guess, because there is a separate uh, vector type. So um, what was it? JSON or a, a list P, a list P, and then cons one two. Um, what we want is a list of a lists to try this out. So one level list, the outer of the A list, the inner of the A list, name dot two, and then delete the rest here. Okay, I think that's enough. All right, so if I were to take out one level of parents, cool, that works. Okay, that's that's a very helpful help helper function. That's great. So let's go back to the code, and then in this case I can say I wonder if they also have a function to force it to be an array. JSON, array, mm, a list, encode a list, print a list. Okay. Uh, Ashraz says those answers is a little bit behind on the current topic. Yeah, you know, that's the thing I don't like about this restream is that um, the chat gets so behind that the things that are showing up to me now are probably from like you know 20, 30 seconds ago. Okay, so I want to do. A little tweak to rows. So if um, JSON a list p rows, then I want to wrap it in a list. Otherwise, we're just going to uh, give rows back. And let's see what that does. In fact, we could probably just bring this back in now. Join that. 
execute, save, jump back into B term, run it again. Um, wrong. Is Jason Alice P? Okay, let me think about this for a second. If uh, not, okay, if and not array p <laughs> rows jeez man okay so yeah i think that was enough right if and not if it's not an array and it's an it's an a list then we want to make it a list but no actually we want to make it an array because that's how they store it yeah okay so i think is that enough Array P, no. Vector. So th there may be a better way to do this. Let's do this. Apply vector rows. That's going to be fun. Okay. <laughs> we're, we're getting really... In, all kinds of stuff. Yeah, we're doing oh my goodness. really in the weeds here. Uh, Ashra says, wouldn't it be easier to save a single base64 hash of news output in a Lisp variable and work on that repeatedly? Ah, yeah, you got a good point there. So instead of rerunning it from the shell, let's let's see how how much time we've been spending on this. Okay, we got about thirty minutes left in the normal scheduled time, so let's let's speed it up a little bit here. So um, I'm gonna do what Ashra has suggested and. Let's see, I'm gonna grab the output string directly and then save that in a variable and then we can kind of iter iterate it on it really quickly and see what we get. Sounds All right, good. So let's catch that. Def var new test uh, input, paste that. And I'm somehow managed to put quotes around it because this uh, structured editing thing I'm using, um, it's really persnickety. There we go. There's one, there's two. Okay, that's good enough. Technomog says, can can we just have two ELISP in the next new shell version? Well, <laughs> that would be nice, but maybe it won't actually help in this case. Well, you know, it could help because if you have the, uh, the ELISP and you base64 encode that, then you can read it back out and then use read on it and it would work fine, I think. Yeah. All right, so now that would be kind of cool. Display output new slash test input. Entering debugger. Okay, so we're we're at where we need to be on this. Uh, okay, so car it doesn't like car doesn't like that. So that's fine. That actually makes a lot of sense. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna use um, I think it's a ref on oh, oh so it's an array. I don't know if there's a equivalent to map car for arrays, but it should work on sequences. Okay, so sequence. Why is it complaining? Run it again. Car rows. Okay, is that why? Because I'm doing car rows. There it is. Okay, so how about uh, a ref o? Does it take a array and then index? Here we go. Let's do that and then run this one more time. There it is. Okay, so now we have the list. Good job, team. <laughs> All right. So, Teamwork. Yeah, so now we have the list of columns, which is great. And uh, since we have the list of columns, we could also try to build a view on that. So uh, since I don't really know about how to make one of these, uh, well, am I jumping the gun? Probably not. Uh, Supercuber says easy. Yeah, it's easy when you finally get to this point and you can look back on what you did before and say, let's just forget about all of it. Um, so let's look at uh, list uh, list packages because the uh, package.el actually uses this. I hate how it keeps popping over there. List packages. I want to grab the package.el code. All right, cool. So... Um, Package.el uses what's it called? Tabulated list mode. Mode. And it actually defines a derived mode from uh, package or sorry, package menu mode derives from tabulated list mode. So we can basically create a new major mode to display this output. 
Um, let's see. I wonder if I can do this without making a major mode, but for now, let's just assume we're going to do, do it this way. I'll just copy this code and delete all the crap I don't want because I don't remember all the major mode definition stuff at the moment. Paste that in. We're going to make a, a new shell viewer mode, let's call it, or view mode. How about that? Tabulated this mode, um, and we'll say new shell output. All right, major mode for browsing uh, new shell result lists. And then we won't worry about this part right now. Yeah, and thank you, Lispy, for deleting everything else. <laughs> yeah, I just, I, I love it whenever these things just start t taking on a mind of their own. All right, interactive nil. Well, hmm, I do want that to be, okay. Let's, let's say no. Mode line process. I don't really care about that, so let's get rid of that. Tabulated list format. And this is where it actually matters because we need to set our list of columns here to be uh, what gets displayed in the tabulated list format. So um, I wonder, well, let's just make it work first and then we'll make it nice. So package, it seems like this is the width that needs to be displayed. And there's also, I don't know what these predicates are for. The sort packages, oh, okay. So it's like a predicate for sorting purposes. You get an A and B and it probably tells you which one is greater than the other, okay? So um, we can take this and maybe. I wonder if there's like a default predicate we could use because all of this is basically strings except yeah. for some of the numbers. I wonder if it's even necessary. So let me see if uh, this variable specifies that you need to have one or if it's sort of like a nice to have. And once again, the help just jumps over this side. Um, if it's nil, this column cannot be used for sorting. If T, sort by comparing the string value. So let's just go with like maybe T for now on all of these. So if we take this, we can take our columns list. We can use that to set Q tabulated list format. And then um, for each of those columns, we'll do a map care again. And maybe in this one, we can turn these into strings and not have them just be symbols anymore. So I'll do care column. And I think if I do string as a function, no, let's just do format. Format S, there may be a more efficient way to do that, but this is what we're gonna do for now. So that will give us a list of columns as strings. And maybe we could even make the full format that's needed by tabulated list format. So if we need a width, we'll, let's just give it a, um, here, let's say list. And we'll say maybe 20 as a width for that, and then T. Thank you, one all of the above. So let's see, how about evaluate that? And then we can just put calls as the parameter to the set queue and not do anything extra. Why don't you like it? Oh, okay, it's fine now. All right, so I could take this out, comment that out for now. Now, the other thing I don't know is how do you initiate the display of everything that's supposed to show up. I think there's a function called tabulated list display. Um, I will, let's see, tabulated list padding, that looks useful. List sort key, let's say name on that. But we may have to maybe pick the first column name first. Uh, revert hook, we're not gonna worry about that right now because usually we don't have to revert the, the list. Um, okay, so now this initializes the header. Let's get rid of that. And then and the package version status description, those will end up being the ones from the, the structured data. Yeah, I need to get that out of there. That's right. So oh, yeah, yeah. let me drop this here. And then I'll just delete this whole thing. So we'll just assume for now that that value is already set. And then I can switch to buffer and then turn on new shell view mode one to make sure that's on. And then maybe I can do the rendering, whatever that rendering needs to be. So let me evaluate this mode. And then we have new shell view mode. And then go back to the package.el code. It's tabulated list something display. 
Here, let me use Control S. Tabulated list display. No, print, print. Okay, so that emits the header. I think we saw that before. And then tabulated list print. Remember position. So that's just a maybe a local variable parameter. Okay, display. There must be a list variable somewhere. Tabulated. Um, entries. Okay, so entries displayed in the current tabulated list buffer. So I wonder how those have to be formatted. Maybe if we pull up the help, it'll tell us. Okay, so it should either be a function or a list. If a list, each element has a form ID and then an array column descriptor. So do I set this tabulated list entries? Okay, so this is let's see print info simple. Cool. Status list package simple name face a lot of a lot of information in here hopefully we don't need all of this we can just get like a basic display with strings okay tabulated list entries menu get status okay find upgrades all right let's just go back then i wonder if the manual will tell me anything so emacs uh, tabulated list mode Probably not. I think I looked at this before and it was kind of sparse in terms of information. Entries. Okay, so buffer local variable specifies the entries displayed in the buffer. If the value is a list, each list element corresponds to one entry and should have the form ID contents, where contents is a vector with the same number of elements as tabulated list format. Okay, so now I can jump back to, come on now the code and uh, we need to take the list of rows and format them. So how about we do that? Make another function, uh, define new format rows. And then for each of those row, uh, we need to have an ID and maybe I can have a, yeah, I don't think we have we weren't getting the ID from the um, the output in new shell on that. I think that the ID didn't come through to the output. The ID the ID being like the row number or something. Yeah, the, the row number in the output. So when new shell, it, it has its own knowledge of the ID. So yeah, yeah, it counts the rows for you. You can um, yeah. Is there a way to add that in? Ashra says the oh. ID may be nil, so we could probably skip it. But yeah, if there's a way to like sort of yeah. fold it into the output, that'd be cool. But we don't yeah, need to do that play right with now. that for a minute and see if we can do that. Yeah. So um, let me see. ID, uh, we'll call it zero. Drop that let around. Uh, and in this row, we're going to create a vector with the items. Oh, hold on. So we need to convert the items into a vector. So what I'll do instead is apply. I need to rip the um, the keys off as well. Oof, there's gonna be like another level of map car here. Map car, lambda, uh, pair, and then just grab the cutter of the pair on the uh, row. Okay, so that gives me the values of the row. And I also want to slam a, an ID on front. So cons ID, put the map here as the second part of that. Drop this down one line. And uh, that should be it. I got the ID and then I have the, oh, no, 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 that's wrong. This part needs to be the vector. So I need to do this sort of reversed. And I'm sure there's probably some nice fancy little way I could do this with, uh, with Lispy, but I'm gonna skip that right now. Let's do this. And then here we're gonna say apply vector. And I need to make this a symbol. Okay, then I can just drop this down one line. So apply vector to the output of map car, which rips off the, the keys for each value of the A list. And then at the end, I need to uh, increment the number. Do I have a like an ink F? Ink F. Great. Hey, let's just do this. 
let's make this uh, negative one, ink F ID, because I don't want to put this at the end because it's going to make it look really ugly. All right, place optional, ink F is not known to be defined. Uh-huh, uh, oh, mm, yes, good good call, Ashraz. That's you're right about that. I could just drop cutter into here instead. I don't know if I need to have the hash or not. Then I could just join those lines. Okie dokie. So now, um, format rows should be good. <laughs> I can tell. Yeah, we'll find out in just a moment whether I'm right about that. So set queue, tabulated list entries, and then new slash format. Was that right? Format rows. I'm laughing at chaos. Um, yeah. You need to call Ryan Levick to complete your lawful good Microsoft YouTubers. Then, then we'll be too far on the side of Rust, I think. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's pretty heavily leaning to Rust. I, I think we need to have it at least be half a lisp here. Let's see. Um, okay. That was epic. What what just happened here? <laughs> yeah. We'll see if this code works. If it works the first time, we'll be very uh, surprised. Uh, I'll get a, a bonus from uh, from from no one. <laughs> so let's see. Display output. That should be good. Now if I. Let's go to the new shell view mode. I think that should do it all by itself. I've already set the list format. I set the list entries. Then I called new shell view mode. That sets these things, and it's a header. And I think there was one last step that I needed from here. Uh, init header. Mm, no. Print. Is that the one that will in kick it off? Populate. Okay, so I need to call that too. So I'll just grab this really quick. Jump back here. One line down. Print it. And then eval. Okay, so here's what I'm going to try to do. Let's run this one more time. Uh, wrong number of arguments on format rows. Which part? Oh, format rows. I did not pass in. What did I just do? Okay. Format rows. I did not pass in rows. That's pretty obvious. Cool. Save it. Eval this. Um, wrong number of arguments. Map car one. Okay, so which one is missing the... Ah, this one does not have rows, I think. Okay, let's get that. Jump back. Run that again. Wrong number of arguments. Major mode. Save current buffer. Oh, new shell view mode. Ah, is that because it's not interactive? So now let's see about the uh, new shell view mode. Okay, so there's no parameters to this. That's fine. So new shell view mode. Since I didn't make it interactive, it doesn't have a parameter, so maybe that's that's okay for now. Jump back here, run it again. Another error, wrong type argument array P. I think, yeah, so I made this list and apparently it needs to be an array. So we're almost there. I think it's gonna work once I get this little yeah, bit of stuff. Yeah, it like we're getting close. Yeah, so uh, the columns infer columns probably needs to um, turn this into a vector and I think that I need to get the car of that so apply um, vector I know I keep saying vector but I'm saying it for my own amusement not because I pronounce it incorrectly <laughs> vector vector uh, cutter of no no sorry car of this list we want the car of the map car and now let's jump back to this line. Ah, so what? Oh, it wants the, the column to As be a list? a list. Yeah, man, come on. This is like layer after layer of confusion. Okay, so each one of these, now everybody gets a list. You get a list, you get a list, everybody gets a list. Where is it? Infer columns, um, format. 
not to get the collective eye rolling of everyone in chat right now, but I was like, you know, if we had gradual types, we could sprinkle some type information. In <laughs> you know, that would make it way, way more uh, helpful. <laughs> Format is a vector of lists. Every, jeez, is that really the case? Like everything in the... I wonder why the headers have to be a list. That's interesting. Name, width, sort, name, width, sort. Did I not do that? Okay, so let me think about this for a second. I need to write out what infer columns gives back because I want to see what the output is. So here, um, message calls, do some print line debugging. Okay, jump back. Come on. Uh, okay, so I need to go to the messages buffer. Oh, oh, whoa. Okay, so it needs to be a list inside. What happened there? That's wrong. Obviously, it needs to be more than just the um, one column. So my code has an issue. In for a column, see what time is it now? 52, okay. I think we can, we can you try got to get it. this eight running. Minutes. We're almost Plenty there, almost time. there. Best kind of debugging. Of print, print line debugging is the best kind of debugging. It's really the only kind because <laughs> I don't have time to run an actual debugger. You know, it would be so much more efficient if I ran a debugger, but I just don't have time. Yeah. I mean, the car is going to grab the first one, right? Um, yes, you're right about that. So I was expecting this to be a list of lists, but I think that was my mistake in thinking. So let's do that. You're right. I think that's the issue. Now we will run this one more time. Okay, so now we got the display with the columns showing up. Now it just doesn't nice. like the, the input. So, okay, we are, we're almost there. Almost. Uh, debugger entered lisp error, wrong type argument list p. Uh, oh, so it wants... It wants a list instead of an array? Yeah. Well, didn't it not tell me it wanted a vector for that? I mean... <laughs> I love the inconsistency. I, maybe I'm just reading it wrong because, you know, whenever you get into streaming mode, you're just like invisible. Yeah, you kind of read like three words and go. Yeah, yeah I know what you I'm, mean. I'm, I'm operating on my own intuition more than I'm actually reading. Okay, so uh, vector. Let's so see. Instead of apply vector in the row. Let's see rows. Display output. So it is the output that we're having a problem with now. So is it this one here that's causing the problem? I was wondering, is it when you're preparing the rows? Oh, this is wrong. This is absolutely wrong because I'm doing it okay. at the wrong place. This, um, yeah, this this is the wrong place for this. I think. I think this was only if. Oh no, that's right. I'm sorry. So this is supposed to be a vector itself, rows. Format rows. Maybe wasn't that a const cell instead of a list? Um, I, well, it looked like a vector. Let's run it one more time and see what happened. So it's it's checking for list p, but it's getting a vector, which is the list of values for that um, item. And can it tell you like what what line that that's occurring at? Uh, at the moment, it doesn't seem to be. But I think what's happening is that. Um, it's running list print, and for the first item, it uh, this should probably be a list. It actually seems to be operating just fine. So I think I'm doing a vector somewhere else, probably in the this part. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. So if I get rid of that, oops, don't want that. Get that out. Get that out. Join this up. Cons ID map car, and I might need to wrap this in a list. No, let's let's leave it. Maybe it'll tell us if it's got another problem. Yeah, so. and then see what it does. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. I think that's what's happening. I need to wrap it in a list. I need to wrap it. Cool. Um. Right. Here. Yeah. Types would make this a lot easier. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of pattern matching the thing you have above as well, in a sense, because you have a list. Yeah, it is for sure. Okay, new problem. <laughs> you, you were looking for it to be an array. Now you want it to be, uh, sorry, a, vec a list and you want it to be an array now. What is happening? <laughs> okay. So it's like, it can be a list at one level and then... Th this is the point. Ugh. Come on. Vector. Ah, oh, Jesus Christ. Space, vector. Thank you. Okay, now I think that we're going to be okay. Okay. 
I'm, I'm mystified. I don't get it. Like it, no, it, a list. No, an array. No, a list. That's funny. Ashra says, "I guess you need list ID apply vector instead of cons ID." Oh. Oh. Maybe you're right about that. Maybe you're right about that. Actually, yeah. Let's try that. Let's do this here. Um. Yeah. Let's try that. You might have it, Ashra. Let's see. Odd length text property list. Oh, because it's too long? One, two, three, four. We only have four columns. That's fine. Print entry, print column. Oh, are we putting the um, the row index as the first item? Mm, yeah, they, they want it to be... Um, hmm. That's so so it should have five total? Print entry. Let's look at their code. Print entry. And it grabs with print call. Yeah, Ashraz is as confused as we are. Okay, tabulated list print call in. A ref calls in. Odd length text property list. Number of columns. And in calls comes from there. Linked tabulated list format. Okay, that knows that it's four columns. It does this four times for each one. Uh, every element in the contents should be a string. Otherwise, it should be... Oh. Oh. So let's check that really quick. Is it this function that's causing the problem? So a ref list format in. Um, name int zero. Oh, I have to get all this stuff. Oh, no, I do that. That's the, that's the list format. Okay, so name width props. That's number three, so it must have number two. The number is 1069 is probably the trigger. Yeah, let's let's take yeah. a look at this first. That's another nice little issue. I guess I can just quickly do a little check and see. Let's let's try that out real quick. I'm gonna do um, in the format rows if the can we just like two string at all? <laughs> yeah. So I guess you could do that. Yeah, so defund a uh, new prepare column value. Um, val, I don't know, value. Sure. If um, string p value, uh, value, otherwise format value, I think that should be good enough. So we could probably just sure. try that out real quick. Uh, new slash prepare column value uh, 42. Prints 42, cool. but if we give it a string of 42x, it gives a string 42x. Okay, so now we can throw. Mm, we need to. How about this? I know this is kind of cheating, but let's do this. Ah, <laughs> oh, damn. How about this? Ugh. Value, cutter, pair. And then for these, we're just going to replace this with, uh, oh no, value's fine. So we're good there, good there. That works. So now we can just pass in pair column value. Execute that. Execute that. Now let's try to run it again. Buffer is read only. What are you talking about? Oh, you know what? It might actually be working and it doesn't like what I did read only mode turn it off oh it has license written here i think it's yeah that's a good start it started working so how about this run it one more time oh, again give me a break it does look like the quote the the string is working now yeah the string shows up correctly but i think we got a, an issue with um something else odd length text property list so text property list tells me that um for the actual text that's meant to show up it's actually expecting a property list instead i think we did see that in the way that the package.el package is sorry let's go to the buffer package.el.gz and um list print there was some other function they had tabulated list print there was something they used. Uh, 
I don't even remember where that was in the code. There's friggin' how many lines? Four over four thousand lines of code in here. Um, print, print help section. Man, there was. I know what it looked like, but I don't know what any words were inside of it. Package. No. There's a million package strings in here. How about this? Tabulated list format. Uh, entries, maybe. There we go. Okay, cool. Like, do we have to pass another piece to each item that it's displaying? Yeah, that would be really lame if so. Symbol name. Propertize, propertize. Yeah, it looks like it needs propertized text for each one. But if I just do, like, propertize, blah, with nothing else, it gives me a string back, which is useless. Um, what is face? Face, PK status, okay. Man, this is annoying. We're so, like so close. Yeah. String rest properties. Okay. I think there's like a bold property. I just make all of them bold and see what happens. Um, let's see. Sure. Let's see, Emacs properties. Hopefully this is gonna work because I'm I'm losing my will to live here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, staring deep in the uh, the, the, the abyss, the, the Emacs abyss. Um, property lists. Oh, okay, this is a regular old P list. Can I just do a list? It says odd numbered list. Like it doesn't like it for some reason, which I don't really understand. Um, yeah, without knowing exactly what part of the code it's complaining about, it's actually pretty tricky. <laughs> I was noticing that you have to kind of guess where, um, which argument or which parameter. Mm -hmm. How about this? Let's just pull a foreground green. Sure. Propertize, blah. And then we're going to dump that in here. Okay, so <laughs> I think that's not a list either. Well, it's, it's a propertize list maybe. So let's let's check it out. Um, go back, whoops, kill that, go back to Emacs new shell, and then for, I think each of these, right? Mm -hmm. In the prepare column value, we need to turn that into that propertize list. Propertize, and then I'll move this up in the list. Whoops, what did I just do? It seemed right. Okay. All right, so, whoops, all right, eval. Now, it's gonna be really lovely whenever all this text comes out green. <laughs> I guess nice green text. Yeah, we'll be going back to CRT mode. Oh, um, awesome. All right. Odd link, property link set. Okay, so it gave us an error again. I think every time I do this, I have to go back to that buffer and make it not read only. How about I just do that? Display output, we've selected the buffer, read only mode zero. Let's try that one more time. This is probably not the right way to do that. Odd length property to list. An interesting thing is that it doesn't actually, um, what did I do? It doesn't throw the error anymore. It, it writes it out to the console. Insert text button, odd length text property list. Okay, well, uh, I think we've made some progress here. I don't know if it's worth trying to forge ahead too much more, but we could definitely pick this up in another stream, I think, because, um, you know, I don't know what you think about... Oh, yeah, definitely. Trying to I call like it here. <laughs> yeah, I think, we're, I think we're close. It seems like, yeah, there's just some... We're hitting some snag on actually getting the data in the table, but I'm excited because it already looks like this is the direction we want to go. We've got our columns. We've got a bit of data. Uh, we'll be able to style the data and, and sort it and all kinds of stuff once we actually get it set up. So The interesting yeah. thing is that it does actually seem to be sorting this as well. You can see that the license and yeah. tests are changing, uh, but none of the other information gets displayed. So uh, there's something else that's missing here. Yeah, I assume it's just like some piece of, of how the rendering is happening. We just have to stare at it a little longer and we'll figure that out. Yeah, But um, yeah, we can pick this back up if you want to.
yeah, definitely we should try it another time. Maybe next time we can uh, even try it on on your Twitch channel if you want, or we can do it back here, whatever <laughs> whatever you like. We'll talk about that ourselves offline. But uh, hopefully, yeah, we'll figure that out. yeah, hopefully this is interesting to people, at least to see us trying to integrate these two programs together. Um, if anybody, you know, knows the answer to these things and you're just screaming at the screen saying it's exactly this thing, <laughs> just, you know, leave a comment, let me know, and I'll go try to fix yeah. it next time. Well, I mean, we can also check in what we have because it does somewhat work. It's getting it's getting to the point where you can actually do uh, just a little bit of of um, the steps that you would need. If yeah. someone wants to send a PR and fix it up, then we yeah, can yeah. kind of run with that. We can try to run with it and then, then move on to the next thing. Uh, Technomog says, is the tabulated data view usable in org mode source output sections? Not, It wouldn't be directly because this is sort of its own mode. But um, I think we could easily have a way to dump this into an org mode document if that's what somebody wanted to do. It could just be like a different command to, to push it into uh, Emacs. And the other option, yeah. obviously, is to use org babel and have a source block with a new shell command invocation and then take that output and then drop it below as a, a table. So yeah. it's definitely we possible. Were Go ahead. Yeah, we were kind of talking about um, one of the things that New Shell can do is to take that structured data and output it in different formats. We were trying JSON really hard to get the JSON working, but um, there's Markdown, and I was scribbling together a org mode uh, table output as well this morning, so we could potentially even invoke that from New Shell, have an org mode table, and then throw that into org mode. Yeah, definitely. I think that's, that's another really good integration that we could try uh, maybe next time. Uh, let's see. Kayo says the end goal is to run new shell in ANSI term, etc. Yeah, I mean, um, one one obvious thing would be to um, if you have a, if you're running new shell inside of a shell and you're running it in the context of Emacs, you probably want to be able to interact with the output of things from new shell in Emacs. So uh, you know, you could be in V term or ANSI term or whatever, and then be typing commands in new shell, and then it automatically send some of that stuff to Emacs to process it further. Um, but there's obviously other ways we could do this integration. It's just like that seemed to be the most interesting one to start with because we were sort of bridging that gap between the two programs uh, through a little bit of glue in the middle. I think that's everything. Um, okay, uh, JT, thanks so much for being here and, and watching me uh, furiously try to code <laughs> and this is fun. stumble through. Uh, it, was, it was a lot of fun. Yeah, I appreciate it. Um, so like I said before, for all the people who uh, weren't, here whoops weren't here in the beginning let me get back to the presentation uh check out uh, assistance with jt on youtube uh also uh give them a follow follow on uh twitch and uh yeah over there and twitter and uh yeah uh, jt makes a lot of great videos about operating systems and programming languages uh jt just finished doing a language jam what was it like maybe two or three weeks ago where mm -hmm. they they took a month uh was it a month or was it a week uh, it was do... a weekend. People um, over the weekend made a, a programming language based on a theme. And we had like 90 teams submit projects. So it, was, it was quite a blast. Yeah. So imagine you're going to do more of those. So if you like this idea mm -hmm. of you know writing your own programming language, which I think probably some people who watch this channel are in that category, uh, keep an eye out for the next Lang Jam because that should be a lot of fun. I might try to do it the next time, but we'll see if I have time with all the crazy crap I'm doing. Um, Great. Thank you so much uh, again, JT, for being here. And thank you all who joined up today on this sort of uh, unusual stream time for me. I appreciate you all being here and all the feedback. Lots of really helpful comments uh, that saved our tails a couple of times. So that's great. And uh, yeah, let's see. Ashraz is giving me like code from the C level here. Uh, we'll, <laughs> we'll talk about it in Discord, Ashraz. I appreciate it. All right. As always, thanks a lot for watching. And until next time, happy hacking. We'll see you.